Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good afternoon, Team Crew Lab community. My name is Major Ian Brown. I'm the Operations Officer at the Brew Crew Lab Center for Innovation and Creativity. And on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Crew Lab Center, welcome back to the Brewcast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not reflect the views of the Crew Lab Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the U.S. government. We'll also be recording this webcast for the benefit of those in our community of interest who can't join us today. So we ask that you be mindful of keeping your microphones muted to avoid disrupting our conversation, as well as turn off your own webcams to help us stream smoothly. Today's broadcast will be a little different in that it's largely question and answer. So if you have a question, just type it into the group chat and we'll get to as many as we can in the order we get them while August is with us. So today we're excited to welcome Crew Lack Center non-resident fellow August Cole. August is an author exploring the future of conflict through fiction and other forms of fiction storytelling. His talks, short stories, and workshops have taken him from speaking at the Nobel Institute in Oslo to presenting at South by Southwest Interactive to tackling the dirty name obstacle at Fort Benning. With Peter W. Singer, he is the author of the bestseller Ghost Fleet, a novel of the next world war published in 2015, and Burn In, a novel of the real robot revolution published earlier this year. A former Wall Street Journal reporter, besides being a Team Krulak non-resident fellow, he is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brent Scowcroft Center on Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council. He directed the Council's Art of Future Warfare project, which explored creative and narrative works for insight into the future of conflict from its inception in 2014 through 2017. He also consults on creative foresight at Spark Cognition, an artificial intelligence company, He's long been a friend and contributor to the Kulak Center's activities, acting as a writing mentor for our Destination Unknown graphic novel series, and a judge for several of our creative writing contests. Yes, so our August, we're very happy to have you here. Welcome. Oh, I'm really uh, honored to be able to speak to uh, everybody who took time out of their day to gather, and, and I've really enjoyed being part of the, the Kulak community, so it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, well, we're, we're very happy for all you to for this. Uh, so before we jump into some of the questions, uh, and again to the audience, if you want to start getting your questions ready, just throw them in the chat. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about what your latest writing projects have been? Sure. You know, my my work uh, it, it kind of has different channels in a way. So the the one uh, channel that I think has probably gotten the the most attention has been writing novels with Peter Singer, which has been incredibly fun. And that's uh, we're about seven years into that collaboration, which began when I used to live in the Washington, D.C. area, and we got to know each other, and, and that uh, led to our uh, teaming up on Ghost Fleet, which came out in 2015 and, and was a way to talk about a threat that we felt like wasn't really being talked about in a, in a way that reflected reality, and that was China's military rise. And, it, and not only that, but its strategic ambitions. And this summer, we uh, followed up with, uh, it's not a war story, but a, a book called Burn In, which is a novel of the real robotic revolution that explores the intersection of technology and politics uh, and, and society when AI and automation in the late 2030s begin to fundamentally pull America further apart even than, than it is today. And, and we follow a FBI agent who's on the hunt for a terrorist trying to use technology essentially against the country. Um, and and that's, that's been a really, I think, valuable form of storytelling because in a book format, you have, you know, 120 to 140,000 words uh, that really can develop not only context and, and kind of larger information, but, but characters, people. And, and ultimately, you know, this form of fic in, uh, you know, fictional intelligence or fiction intelligence, and, and, you know, we've been calling it useful fiction lately, allows, I think, that character first uh, or character forward storytelling that, that allows people to connect with ideas that are, that are, that are kind of big um, and, and also like immediately important. Separately, I, I do other types of fiction uh, that I write on my own, which is short stories. And, and that's been really fun, both just like in a creative sense to kind of work on my own voice, but also uh, to be able to support projects that you know range from like NATO, I like Command Transformation, I've done a couple for them this year, that look at that 2040, particularly further out operating environment, uh, where there's a lot of big questions about everything from you know the, the human-machine relationship to the kind of this, what's the nation state going to look like in two decades. And uh, over the last few years, that short fiction has been, I think, useful for, you know, groups that range from, um, 
you know, the DOD's uh, AI uh, commission uh, that was looking at ethics. I did a bunch of vignettes for them. Uh, that was, I think, a really fun project for me because it allowed me to kind of engage in ethical issues, which I really find extremely interesting when it comes to new technologies. I've worked with the Norwegian Army, the British Army, too, and I have more projects uh, in the works along those lines. And then I'm, I'm separately working on a solo book uh, right now, kind of putting that together, which I hope will come right over the winter. And that is about, um, I don't want to get into it too much, but it's sort of about like the future of like tactical cyber operations, you know, kind of in the great game around the Arctic. Uh, it's, it's a really fun story, kind of a spy story. All right, awesome. Well, we look forward to seeing that come out. Uh, I know we've, I've got some of the links in my own files for some of your previous work, so we can put stuff on the panel once we finish. Great. Um, so we'll start getting into some of the questions that I've got here. So we know that, um, you know, you mentioned the kind of the first big thick in novel you did with Peter Singer, um, you know, Ghost Fleet. I know that it had a big impact on the Marine Corps in particular when it was released. In fact, I remember it was about a month after General Neller became the Commandant. He came down to Quantico where I was and to do like, you know, kind of open house, you know, town hall kind of thing. And within about five seconds, he was asking Marines if they had read that novel. And uh, he said, if you haven't done that, you need to go do that because it's an important look at our developing operating environment. Um, and so I know also, uh, Vernon, I read that myself over the summer, too. Um, it's maybe keep an eye on my Roomba at home to make sure it's not doing that. <laughs> um, so that's also got for its exploration, uh, you know, sort of that man-on-man -man teaming between AI autonomous systems and human beings and exploring those interactions. So um, uh, with all of that, why why do you think that books like yours there's the, and, and the stories you've written in some of you know, our own projects like the Destination Unknown series, um, there's been a resurgence in using these things to explore aspects of national security. And it's, you know, it's not a new genre per se, but it kind of ebbs and flows. So why do you think we're seeing a, a resurgence in this style in this day and age uh, as a framework for exploring future war? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. It's something I, I reflect on a lot and, and I'm trying to, you know, understand as well, because you can be in the middle of doing something and, and sometimes lack the perspective on, on kind of what exactly is happening. And as, as best as I can kind of see, you know, we, we have a, a legacy of this sort of fiction that really goes back to, uh, well, it goes back much further than the Cold War, but let's just start in the 80s where, you know, Sir, uh, uh, I think it's Sir John Hackett's Third World War, you had Clancy's uh, Red Storm Rising that really, I think, did very excellent jobs of thinking the unthinkable. And, and making those those kind of explorations of like the ultimate cataclysm, right? You know, in the 80s, which was uh, just short of nuclear you know, conflict, but like a, a, a global war that would pit the Soviet Union versus U.S. And did that like technically, you know, well, did it with, you know, pretty good narratives. And, and you know, then there's sort of this end of history phase in the 90s, you know, where, where there's less kind of consideration of these larger kind of, kind of questions in the military sense. But at the same time, you see the rise of like cyberpunk and uh, genres that for me at the time were really influential. You know, and you fast forward to kind of the 20 teens and, and where we are here in 2020. And, and what I really feel like the, the, this kind of larger movement to, to make, you know, fiction official has, has roots in kind of three areas. You know, one is the, the pace of technology is moving so fast that conventional foresight and analytical, you know, practices and techniques just, just have trouble keeping up. And so we need more tools in that toolbox. You know, I'd never say just read Ghost Fleet. Don't, don't go read like Red Star Over the Pacific by, you know, Toshi Yoshihara. Um, you know, you need to you need to read everything you can, but including fiction. Uh, you know, the the second might be that you know we are at a point where failure of imagination has like you know existential risk you know attached to it, and being able to consider the kinds of scenarios realistically, you know, not kind of in the in the the fantastical or the hyperbolic, but rather rooting these kinds of explorations in fact. I think it's critical. You know, for for me personally, that has meant with these novels with feet. That you know every technology trend in there is uh, uh, you know social demographic you know political trend, it's all rooted in something that's like you know seen today or known today or or is like being developed or you know building. So we we show that with endnotes, right? That's kind of our 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 way to to communicate with the reader to have that level of transparency. Um, you know the last I think the third is that we are at a point where we realize that good ideas can come from anywhere and and narrative and stories connect people so effectively you know that's very much part of the human experience um and i and i think this crop of kind of military future fiction does that and it does it in two ways you know one is it allows an individual who has an idea to connect with perhaps a senior senior leader uh, who, who maybe needs to be like alerted to a blind spot it allows them to connect with their peers 
Um, but it also allows people outside the conventional, you know, military realms to kind of start to, I think, engage or look at again um, the sorts of emergent thinking that's, that's going on in the defense and security community. You know, the gap can be quite wide at times, right, in civil society in America and the tech sector particularly. And, and I think, you know, anything that can kind of help close that or create that sort of understanding or connection is really helpful, uh, particularly when, again, you know, the globality of technological distribution means good ideas, muscle threats, you know, can can literally come from anywhere. And that trend is only going to, I think, increase in the next 10 years. And and my my hope is that, you know, we, we have this both bottom-up movement where you have groups like the Military Writers Guild, SIMSEC, uh, and you have institutional approaches to it, like you know, Commandant's Reading List, as you pointed out, uh, U.S. Naval Institute, you know, others in and around the Naval and Marine Corps community. They're really, I think, uh, effectively, you know, shepherding these these through. And, and you know, I feel like the Krulak Center is a great bridge in between those two, right? You know, you're within a larger institution, Marine Corps University, but yet able to channel and, and I think you know bring out the best in the kind of the crowdsourced grassroots aspects to this. And that's where a lot of the originality and the like, let's just try this, you know, build it on the fly approach, I think is most effective. You know, the point is not perfection. The point is not you know, perfect prediction. The point is to, you know, exercise these kind of creative muscles we all have and, and to do it collectively and together because that, that, that last piece there, I think is, is really important. And, you know, like you, you could also say, well, what's like the real world implication or what's the real world, you know, application. And, you know, we, we've seen it in, you know, a variety of things, whether it's awareness around like hardware hacking, to take one example from like the ghost fleet world, but but I also feel like in kind of just the practice of being creative is really important from like a you know a neuroplasticity perspective, right? You know, just that being able to be creative in one discipline can help you be creative in others. And and of course not everyone's gonna write, and that's fine. But just being involved in that kind of larger community, I think, can be incredibly, you know, personally enriching, but also collectively like critical uh, in this day and age. No, absolutely. And I, you know, part of from the Kulak Center, you know, why why we're so proud of the Destination Unknown series, for example, is that we're, we're pulling out some of that creativity and partnership with, you know, just tapping the, the creative thought and forward-lookingness of some of our own Marines. So it's been a very rewarding experience. All right. Um, so kind of going into that real-world application of uh, the things that are explored in, in useful fiction or thinking, kind of focusing on, on your two books with Peter Singer for the time being. For the Marine Corps um, in, in particular, what are a couple of big takeaways that uh, Marines who read those books to take with them um, as they prepare for the operating environment they're in. I mean, I think number one is that like, you know, Marines make great heroes, right? Like, you know, Ken Burnin has, you know, Agent Laura Keegan, who's a Marine. Uh, Ghostly had, uh, you know, one of our, our insurgents in Hawaii who had, was went by our call sign, Conan, uh, Caroline Doyle. Uh, you know, so so I think, you know, the, the kind of future of the Marine is, is assured in, in, in the thicket that, that I've been produced at least. So, and I, and I continue <laughs> to think that. Um, but more seriously, you know, the the, the lessons from Burnin, I think, are really you know uh, important for the moment we're in right now. You know, we have this incredible uh, you know pressure building in American society that's driven by many different forces. But some of them are technological as much as political, and the, the, the kind of intertwining of the two can't be you know disentangled, and, and, and less so in the next decade. COVID particularly has, I think, ushered in a much quicker reckoning with everything from automation, you know, software driven economy and disruption uh, to just kind of social and political uh, recognition that the system, if you want to call it that, you know, the American experiment, you know, has has a lot more brittleness and frailty than 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 we probably want to admit, particularly at a time when we're trying to, you know, make a credible great power strategy. So one of the one of the first you know, kind of lessons learned, I think, from Bernie and you know, for people who who read it, is that you know, the trust is at the core of the human machine relationship, and and that's whether uh, it's uh, you know, kind of a, a buddy bot like TAMS, which is the the FBI uh, kind of law enforcement type robot that that works with Agent Keegan, but also, I mean, I, I think there's a, a kind of a spinoff of that idea of trust, which is the trust between you know us like you know, people uh, that that is also uh, put under pressure from the kinds of breakthroughs that fundamentally reshape, you know, like the, the the kind of social contract when it comes to work, right? The the growth of like the turking economy, the micro economy um, is, uh, I think, unfortunately going to be, you know, increasingly prevalent. And the software drives, you know, many people around the world out of conventional employment into kind of alternative models. You know, that Uber driver, that that uh, Postmates, et cetera, that, you know, micro uh, labeling you know, job from, from Amazon's Mechanical Turk for AI, you know, database, you know that that has the potential to become more normative, right, than it is now, and and that has large social consequences. 
Um, so, so thinking about these big systemic risks, risks is kind of the second point too, which I feel like society's transformation due to AI and automation in the next decade is, is underappreciated. And this isn't a sort of the robots will steal all our jobs. And, and nor am I really worried about the robot uprising, you know, in the kind of James Cameron Terminator sense. What I am worried about is like the way that, that we as individuals will respond to this kind of shifting, almost like tec tectonic movement of some really important and very difficult to solve, uh, problems that don't necessarily fit in like the national security basket, but are totally related to the kinds of challenges that, that we, we know can imperil, you know, a nation. And obviously, you know, the adversary ability to exploit those kinds of uh, divisions and, and rifts is, you know, well known by now. It has been since 2016. And, you know, I don't think it's going to become any less of an attack surface. And so there's a really kind of dark spiral that we can start to go down, I think, where the vulnerabilities and the problems we create from ourselves and AI automation shake up society can be exploited by external adversaries, again, you know, China, Russia, among others, that uh, allow us, I think, to really kind of consider these anew, that, that the security implication of, you know, something that may seem unrelated, like universal basic income, you know, has to be kind of considered at that 100,000 foot level. So um, third thing, you know, is is maybe, you know, goes without saying, but like data is everything, right? And, and I think that the ability to understand, you know, day-to-day -day life in the future, which is going to be infused with AI, perhaps so much so that we don't even really talk about AI as a thing, uh, is going to be critical to the kind of, the kind of uh, you, know, ec you know, forward march if it's, you know, hopefully progress uh, here in the U.S. and in the West, but also in terms of what happens on battlefields of the future, whether they're virtual or real. Uh, that primacy of information and rules around it, the, you know, norms and ethics that are attached to it, I think is, is so important. And, of course, the economic models, too, that go with it. So those are kind of like the three big takeaways probably for Burnham. Um, I can keep fire hosing on ghostly too, if you want, or if you want to take a break and ask a question. Yeah. That's uh that's a good dive. And that, that kind of, I, I can transition to the next question actually off of that um, pretty well. So, you know, I mean, so you, you mentioned, you know, we've seen a lot of gaps and, and opportunities for disruption that external actors have already, uh, you know, exploited on the, against the United States. And in your books as well, at least in sort of the initial stages of each crisis in both books, um, you know, the U.S. is kind of on its back foot until it, you know, figures it out and figures out find gaps in their industry. But um, with, with that, there are some of uh, the opportunities that now for the U.S. to uh, to exploit new and disruptive competitive spaces that could bend the character of future war in a way that's favorable to us, where we're not on the back foot, where we're leading on the front foot. That's a good question, and I think it speaks to some of the lessons from Ghost Fleet, right, which is like, number one, I think, seeing the world as it is, not as we want it to be. You know, at the time, uh, you know, five, six years ago, when we were uh, looking at the popular narrative, even in D.C. around China, was that, you know, it would be a partner, it could still change. And yet you looked at, like, the way they were spending money on their military establishment, on their defense technology, which at the time was, uh, you know, still, I think, at a point where you could superficially – you know, take it uh, as a less credible threat. But yet it wasn't hard to draw, you know, trend lines outwards and look at, you know, spending, look at, you know, the kind of platforms they're buying and, and just kind of doctrine. And, and I, you know, work only in the unclassified space and, and don't even read Chinese. So I'm, you know, very much grateful for all the folks who've translated a lot of the literature and, and, and reporting into into, into English. Um, but, but it seemed like there was something else going on there, even if it wasn't necessarily popular to, to write about at the time, um, which we worried about. But but it seemed then that if that was the case, then what, right? Like if China is really, you know, on this track and is potentially going to act strategically in an audacious way in the in the Asia Pacific region, what is the US going to do about it? Right. And and you know, the, the book is a construct or you know puts us in the worst possible situation, like on the back foot from the start. And to me that's fascinating, right? Because you know if you think about the country itself as a character in Ghost Fleet, you know, it has to kind of fight its way back, right? And that's that journey, which is made up, of course, of the actions of individuals uh, that's important. But, you know, one of the one of the really crucial parts of that, you know, World War III wartime footing was the role of, like, innovation. And that can be innovation, you know, in, uh, in, in like, the, I don't know, San Francisco Bay and those shipyards that are in Mare Island, right, as we try to kind of rewire effectively uh, a much more secure you know, Zoom Alt in the case of, of, of Ghostly, it could be the way that Silicon Valley, you know, kind of discovers what its wartime role, role should be. Same with Anonymous. Uh, you know, really important conversations to have in peacetime so that if you do get into a great power conflict, like you've, you've done the work to kind of think these things through. Um, 
the, the kind of larger, you know, sense of disruption, of course, you know, that you're, you're talking about thing, you know, there is, it's like, well, if the U.S. is in a position, um, for example, to acknowledge that like data is an incredibly powerful economic driver and will be uh, extremely important in, in the defense and intelligence context, and it already is, but even more so, then it, it would see, it stand a reason that, you know, not being uh, surprised, you know, when you get to the kinds of conflicts we know we're going to see in the next 10 years, uh, that we haven't actually done the hard work to come up with better laws and rules around the use of data. Uh, in wartime, uh, particularly private sector data. You know, I'm incredibly interested in this. This is part of what the next book that I'm, that I'm exploring about is like, how do you essentially redraw like situational awareness when you have, you know, neural nets and machine learning systems, adversarial uh, modeling, you know, that you can essentially you know, create, uh, you know, digital twins of a city that you're going to be operating in or an adversary force. Um, yeah, the other side of that too is like, you know, that, that speaks, I think, to the need to consider like, new domains of operations. And this is some of the NATO ACT work that I've been uh, doing this year, which is in consideration of a potential like an, uh, adding another domain. I mean, they just added space last year, I think. But um, but the, there, you could argue that kind of not just the cognitive domain, but something beyond that uh, is incredibly important too, because once you have that data and precision of information, that this notion of like mass and scale and warfare is it, still like totally relevant. It's just that you have at the same time, the customization of like targeting and influencing that doesn't necessarily mean mass and scale need to be measured in like tonnage uh, or destructive capability that, that, you know, shaping and moving just in the same way online ad models and, you know, algorithmic, uh, you know, dominance happens in the social media space as people try to monetize our, 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 our own social networks. You know, that has like 100% military applications, 150%. I mean, it's just like, I'm all in on that and trying to figure out what that's like. So I'm really intrigued by that. And it feels like, we can do a lot more on that, especially, you know, in the defense and security uh, community, having having kind of a forward position and or a forward leaning position and in, in staking out some of those claims because the private sector is like totally lagging on this stuff. Like you're not going to go to Facebook and ask them to, to to kind of give you guidance on ethical use of data. Um, so who who do you turn to, right? And and I think there's communities within the U.S. defense you know, establishment. Uh, I think SOCOM has a lot to to kind of think about on this, particularly given their kind of mission sets and the importance of data, but also I would say, you know, the, the expeditionary aspect of the Marine Corps future, especially, you know, in the littoral parts of, of uh, Asia Pacific region and or Indo-Pacific and even Africa, where you're going to have to navigate incredibly dense, you know, urban, you know, areas that are going to require, you know, being able to tap into that kind of information because you're not going to simply going to have, you know, when you show up uh, the, the information, the kind of situational awareness you need. So those are some of the kind of, I think, opportunities to kind of in that, to be competitive, right? And even if they're not like, oh, we need a seventh gen fighter, not a sixth gen or something like that. I mean, the hardware stuff still matters, but the way we're buying it just doesn't make me think that like, if we were to say, all right, we want to, you know, leapfrog from fifth to six, you know, although the Air Force may be able to do that, that we're going to get anywhere close to what we actually need to be militarily relevant in the next 10 years, that, that pushing into the software side of warfare, the data side of warfare is probably going to be higher yield. Okay. Well, now, <laughs> then, uh, since that book kind of comes out later this year, then to explore some of that. Um, okay. Different questions in so first, I'm going to turn it over. I think our first one is from uh, our brand chair for cyber conflict and security, Mr. J.D. Work. J.D., are you able to ask the questions out loud? Sure. Um, You've spoken to us a number of times. Always glad to have you back. Um, each time you've always talked a little bit about the principles for thick entry, useful fiction writing uh, as you go through it. Um, would love to hear a little bit more about your process, thoughts, and any new principles you've picked up along the way as uh, you've been doing all of this recently. Oh, that's great. And JD, it's nice to hear your voice. Uh, you know, obviously following you on Twitter a lot is incredibly rewarding. So uh, the chance to just talk and chat about this kind of thing is like, is perfect. Um, yeah, you know, my, my, even though like the term ficant was, I, I said this many times, but it was kind of tongue in cheek when I started because I was trying to come up with like a shorthand way to describe what this is because there is no like name for it yet. Um, and, and Pete has been calling it useful fiction, which I think is a really great label too because it speaks to the very like applied aspects of it. And so, you know, the way the ways that I, I you know, approach, for example, like a, a short story, like one that's commissioned, uh, but it's true of even stories that I've done on my own. I think in the chat, you've mentioned the story Ant Farm, which is one of the first that I wrote uh, for the Atlantic Council uh, about kind of swarm warfare uh, powered by by like crowdsource targeting. Um, uh, and, you know, I'm trying to kind of think about the 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 like the blind spot or like where is the uh, what is the aspect of like a given trend or technology that we may not be thinking about, and it's not just like Black Mirror 
um, you know, I want to I want to take this to like the the, the gnarliest place possible. Um, and and I do love the kind of the punchline aspect to their storytelling. You know, kind of the reveal, which is always in the kind of that last act of a show. But but I'm I am actually trying to think through like very applied problems, right? So um, you know, the the, the story Ant Farm you've mentioned. Was, was very much about, you know, how do you, in the face of looking at like the primacy of AI and data analytics, what if the US, for example, has a different policy approach to using AI in, 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 in military applications? Like, what if we don't? What if we draw a line? Um, then what, right? Could you kind of do a version of China's, you know, human powered, uh, like censorship machine, uh, to, to, you know, induce people to, to kind of gamify it, to have them, you know, help, uh, sort uh, social media and other types of, you know, open source information to understand uh, an environment that you're trying to operate in. Uh, you might be trying to target people for influence or even kinetic stuff like the story. That, that to me was, was really interesting as a, as a way to kind of think through, you know, we're, we're tracking one way, assuming we're always going to have AI, for example, you know, as part of the military, uh, you know, establishments like, you know, in the arsenal. But what if we don't, right? Um, so I'm always kind of trying to think about that. Uh, the other aspect too is is like the character driven notion that I that I spoke about earlier. You know, that's a story that opens up with the perspective of like a gunship pilot, uh, but it's not a you know like an AC-130. It's sort of a modified you know Boeing jetliner that has like a bunch of 3D printing fab fab type uh, capability, so it can drop you know payloads that it that it tailors right for a target set. And and he flies this thing essentially by himself, kind of in and out of like almost like a coma like days. Um, because it's a long duration aircraft, you know, the way that it, it, it's kind of near future. And, and so he's aloft for like six days or five days, something like that. Um, again, thinking about that, like persistent strike and, and, and ISR, like what is the solution on that? Uh, are we going to be, you know, not able to base, for example, Ford and CENTCOM? And so how do we get to those kinds of questions of like, you know, being still able to support our, our you know, in a tactical sense or close air support sense, our, our forces? Um, you know, you can talk about that in a lot of different ways and you could add a pilot list, you know, plane doing that too. But like by putting a human in, in that, in that, you know, kind of couch, if you will, control couch in the middle of that jetliner, you know, makes the story more interesting. Um, you know, burn in as an exploration of the human machine relationship is important because, you know, Agent Keegan has to, you know, work with a bot at the very, you know, point in her own life when her husband's lost his, you know, essentially like perfect job in a law firm. And the social tensions and the familial tensions around her partnership with this machine, uh, and she herself even doubting, like, should I tank this thing or not? Because I know this thing's coming for my job someday. You know, that aspect of it is very real and makes some, I think, critical points. Uh, and, and in a thick or useful fiction type story, you know, you're really trying to get at those, those elements and aspects. And, and another, another facet too in the storytelling, is you know rooting all of the the ideas and trends still in reality, and that's that's something I've I've continued to hew to, even when you know I'll write something further in like 2040 or almost in that kind of zone. I still am trying to look at like the the actual um, you know trends that we're seeing in like the you know tech economy or you know socially with like the way we use social media or uh, you know phone based games that kind of thing for inspiration, kind of the the uh, the ways that we're Shaping human behavior, you know, algorithmically. I think that's really important. And, and, you know, speaking kind of unpopular truths or things that aren't necessarily going to get briefed upwards is, is a really valuable part of Ficant. And I believe as strongly as ever that that's also, uh, really critical. You know, just writing kind of fan fiction for like uh, existing doctrine, I don't think really helps anybody that much, to be honest. Um, there's times when that can maybe be useful, but I think the, the, the narratives that pose questions, right, that don't necessarily even have answers, I think can be some of the most useful. You know, the next destination unknown volume. Uh, when it's released, I think we'll, we'll, I think speak to that too, where there's some really important questions about leadership, about, you know, kind of the idea of strategy, you know, in the era of like instant gratification, you know, in, in the military sense, um, that, that some, some of the writers have really, like McRyan have really ably, ably tackled and, and, um, speaks out. I hope, I hope that answered the question. It wasn't too much of a ramble, but, but that's, I'm, I'm tracking pretty consistently with kind of how I've, how I've been working on these things. Next one, always in search form. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Um, we got another question in the chat from uh, David Strahan. I'll ask your question, sir. Yes, um, thanks so much for the opportunity. It's it's great to hear you speak, Mr. August Cole. Um, well, so I am uh, I'm curious how Ficant, um is being received, like within the broader defense or security establishment. Obviously, 
you know, your books have been very successful and, you know, you've gone and, and spoken about your books and all the themes that they, you know, that they bring to light. Um, but I've also, I've stumbled across your useful fiction website and it seems like you and Peter are kind of positioning yourselves to be advisors um, and, and bringing this, um, this concept of applied fiction to, you know, to almost like a, a more marketable place beyond your novels. Um, so I'm just curious, is there a genuine demand that you're seeing for this sort of thing? And, and is it being, you know, beyond what re recommended reading lists and beyond the sort of creative environment of Krulak and other places, is it being sure. pretty well received? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I think it, it began in a very like tribal way, you know, and, and that was uh, something from kind of the, uh, I think kind of defense entrepreneur sort of model of like growing your, your community of like virtuous and insurgents to use their phrasing. And, and that's sort of how I looked at it. But but as we've been able to get more and more people writing, not just ourselves, we were seeing a lot more interest in it. And and sometimes it's a really hard sell. I mean, to your to your to your point, I think you're right. Internally in an organization, you know, there is an amount of top cover that's required to you know commission a story. You know, you have to fund it, right? You know, you have to you know create kind of a platform for distribution or or understand how that how that will be shared. But but yeah, like we are we are certain that there is an appetite for this and, and not just, you know, the kind of ideas that like Peter, and I can write uh, or kind of people in our, our network, but we can help teach people how to do it. Right. Because that's the ultimate goal is that you're you're kind of spreading the knowledge so that, you know, it is applicable in very discrete cases. You know, it could be a team that's trying to understand a problem better. And so they're going to almost in a design thinking kind of way, you know, try to kind of use fiction to to play, you know, the, the perspective of the user. But also in terms of communicating ideas more broadly beyond the kind of core audience around, you know, really niche or, or very uh, specific you know, issues as, as like in policy, you might find an example of that would be the Cyber Solarium Commission report that came out earlier this year. Um, you know, Pete and I were able to write like a fictional preface to that that, that allowed the reader to, you know, to, to begin the consideration of this over 100 page report. You know, that's that's the product of you know, very serious people looking at you know, recommendations to kind of shore up America's, you know, resiliency and, and, and security on the cyber side. But but what we're we're doing in that in the start of that report is, you know, there's like, you know, a thousand words or so of what it's like to, you know, in the weeks after a cyber calamity has hit DC. And and certainly that was like fresh in our minds because we'd just been, you know, destroying DC and burn in. Um, you know, so it was really you know a, a satisfying thing to kind of know that you could have that vision and have it applied in a very kind of, you know, to your point about like that's not a creative community, you know, necessarily, but yet one that's really open to that because you can, you know, connect and, and appeal to more people. Now, Pete, Pete has an anecdote too, and this is somewhat to the books, but I think it's true of some of the short stories that, that I've been, been able to participate on and write. Um, they get read, you know, fiction gets read even when, when like white papers don't, or as, as Pete has said, like some of his nonfiction books, a lot of people tell him like, I read your book and loved it. And he can tell they ha haven't, but but people are like, no, I really did read Ghost Sleep, you know, or I really did read Burn In. So it, we know it's kind of cracking through, uh, you know, the the attention span of, of people who are, who are very busy with like very serious problems that they're they're trying to you know help tackle. So um, my hope is that 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 continues. Again, it's not just the work that we do, but we can help other people learn how to do it too. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have another question, uh, Christy Bea. Can you, Christy, can you ask your question? Sure. Um, do you think that Ficant can be misused to promote propaganda? Do you think that your writing is free of political and cultural bias, or is it there and part of the narrative? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, you can you could certainly uh, you know take narratives and wield them for um, you know influence operations or whatever. But but in the kind of way that I see Ficant you know being used, because you know Ficant is just simply a form of, of short fiction or, or long form fiction. In storytelling, you know that it that it is trying to address a problem, right? So that you know you're focused on trying to understand and show the reader who can potentially do something about it that you understand their world and that you're alerting them to something that they might be missing. And so the notion of like being able to you know shade that with like a bias, whether it's political or, or you know economic or otherwise, I suppose is always there. And I, I mean, I guess I would have my own you know perspectives and opinions that always are, you know, fueling and feeding into my work, whether it's a question of like justice or whether it's a question of quality or I, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, Burning is a good example, right? Like we, we tackle some very difficult and thorny political issues in that book around extremism on the right, 
uh, around universal basic income, uh, about the algorithmic dominance, you know, of society by a very small number of wealthy people. And, and those are all like three really important issues that, that need to be talked about. And so it's imperative like that they're in the story. So I don't think you want to shy away from, um, you know, these, these, these touchier subjects because they're very much at the root of, of some of the bigger challenges, especially ones that, that don't have a discrete kind of technological or, or even operational kind of framework. Um, and, and you can kind of nest those nonetheless in, in the real world because the real world is messy, right? It is made up of people that are contesting in this, in this sort of idea space. And, and, and more so, um, and more with immediate speed to to coming up. Great, thank you. Um, so I have I got one more question on my preset list here, um, and then if uh, anyone else has another question, get it in there because we're coming up on our stop here. Um, but from uh, next question I got was for um, how do you what advice would you give to you know people who are charged with with doing innovation inside? Uh, military organizations. What what advice would you give them using thicket or useful fiction to help drive future considerations for things like force development or force design, especially in the context when your organization has some some pretty hard constraints on uh, or current operations supporting current readiness. Yeah. Yeah, to me like an environment that's constrained is one of the richest to try to find ways to be innovative. Um and I think being able then to look within not necessarily even without, uh, to find people who have ways that they can surface uh, innovative concepts and ideas through, through, through narrative. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a short story. You know, the use, for example, of like artifacts from the future or uh, like an after action report from the future uh, that reflects some of the, 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 you know, kind of core technical problems or challenges, or, or if it's a budgetary one for that matter, you know, those are other ways to kind of use as like a, a shortcut around the kind of larger challenge of like, do I really have time to write 5,000 words or do I know how to write 5,000 words? Um, you know, fake news stories from the future too are, are another really, I think, effective way to place things in context that, that have been used, uh, I think, in, in many different ways for, for pretty effective reasons. You know, I did something like that recently with this NATO uh, effort to do a series of vignettes uh, from kind of different fronts in this larger kind of context of a, of a a conflict that broke out in the late 2030s. So, so that would be one way. Um, you know, the other is, is I think really kind of understanding in, in using a short narrative, you know, what is, what is the intent? Like what's the ask, right? Whether you're uh, offering something up that you're writing or whether you're kind of putting out a call for, for, for ideas and, and figuring out what, what are the right channels and ways to reach people. You know, one of the really, really interesting Marine Corps uh, and Atlanta Council partnerships that, that happened about four years ago or three years ago was uh, working with the warfighting lab uh, on uh, their uh, MCSEF, you know, the strategic environment forecast. And we were able to help create like a futures uh, narratives annex that was like three short stories and was written mostly by Marines. Uh, and, and that was kind of, they were kind of coached by like Max Brooks, myself, Charles Gannon. Um, but that was remarkable because that was from within the service. You know, that was an all, all Mar admin note that went out you know, to the entire force. And, and there was commitment on the part of the warfighting lab to fly people from literally all over the world. I think we had an embassy guard from Cyprus flown in for like 24 hours for the workshop. Um, when I see that kind of kind of commitment, you know, you know that, it, that it's real. It was Dale Alford, uh, General Alford, who was uh, there at the time, I think. And that, that is one of the best examples of mixing both like top down support, but, but bottom up kind of crowdsourcing. And from that, you got some really interesting explorations of you know, littoral operations uh, in like uh, West Africa, uh, you had a sense of the larger kind of political and, and you know, you know, civilian society challenges that will shape the operating environment for Marines were deploying. You had looks like urban warfare and what kind of technology could be useful, like little rolling bots and drones and things like that. And, and to me, that all speaks to, you know, making, I think, tough choices about, you know, what do we resource and what do we invest in? Because, you know, so much in the acquisition cycle now can be outmoded or outdated based on the speeds that we work at, that it makes it really difficult to place bets, you know, and, and you know, the kind of hard choices that are being made by the current commandant, a commandant burger, you know, I think reflect that, right? You know, is heavy armor still appropriate for the Marine Corps mission, you know, 10 years out? Uh, what is the fixed, you know, fixed wing aviation requirement, right? Like, what is the mission? I was even thinking, like, you know, what if you, you know, did did things in 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 that regard? It's a little less of a, of a thickened kind of challenge, but you could certainly explore this in a way. Like, what would it be like to go through, 
you know, the, the kind of in indoctrination and training, you know, from Marine Corps recruit, if you had to follow or bring with you like a small, you know, bot, like a roll, fly, swim, whatever, and, you know, learn how to like maintain that, you know, program it, modify it, fight it. Uh, and just in the same way that the knowledge that is, that is, that is developed around, you know, how to handle a weapon. Um, you know, simultaneously, you know, could you imagine like a commandant's fight club, right? Like you essentially have a new commandant and their job is to, you know, kill one program of record, you know, every time they come in. And, you know, the world that that creates is one that becomes highly competitive for, for not just kind of the contractor world, uh, but the sort of, you know, the branch and kind of communities that, that, that support it. Because again, you know, the, that's a little bit of a like hyperbolic idea, but, but it's not a, you know, something that, that couldn't be explored with like a fictional approach. And it does reflect the very, very serious competitive aspects of like the operational environment, you know, that, that, that is coming, if, if not already here, especially when it moves at machine speed. So if, if, you know, good ideas and good efforts can survive, uh, you know, that kind of a, that kind of a, of a, of a selection, then there's a good chance perhaps that they can, you know, do so when it, you know, most counts for the nation. Um, you know, other aspects too that even go to the very character of what, it, what is a Marine in 2030? Um, you know, how do we define that? Uh, you know, is it kind of a shock troop? Is it, is it, you know, somebody who can, um, you know, win America's conflicts by any means allowed and necessary, right? And, and, and do that in the littoral regions, uh, just to keep the naval heritage. You know, is there kind of a redefinition of, of what that is supposed to? And those are, of course, conversations are happening now. Uh, but the urgency is, is really real. And what's often missing sometimes is the vision part of it. And that's where the thicket can be applied. And it, look, it's cheap, right? I mean, getting, you know, someone time to write a short story does not, you know, there is no, there is no kind of investment in hardware for that. You have the most important thing needed of all, which is people. Um, you know, those are people who are already, already there kind of working the problems. You're just giving them another tool to do it. Great. Um, and so we're coming up to the end of our time here and kind of, I, I want to give you another, just the last 30 seconds to kind of expand on a little bit. So, um, you know, for those, for those, for the, you know, the branches of the military, really those that had human resource who maybe want to express themselves or, you know, find a way or a voice or a platform to express their own vision, but they're not really sure how to do it. What advice would you give them to kind of to just get that ball rolling for themselves? Oh, that's, that's a really good question. I, I would, uh, you know, take that tribal approach, uh, you know, finding uh, the Krulak Center is the first step. I mean, we're speaking to the, to the choir here, I guess, but, uh, you know, looking at those who are also connecting uh, when it comes to putting forth innovative ideas. Defense Entrepreneurs Forum is another, um, you know, looking at, you know, SIMSEC and other, of the, uh, you know, groups that are really trying to crowdsource because that big tent approach is wonderful and that it includes, you know, people who might ordinarily not be invited to weigh in, right? And that may be, in fact, where you can get some really interesting ideas. Um, you know, the more you write, the more you write is a really basic rule. And I think it's really important. I struggle with that to, to stay as productive sometimes, but, but it can pay off. And even, you know, giving yourself permission, uh, to write, a small amount every day it could be 100 words, you know, it could be 500 the next uh, can help really, I think, make progress. Um, but but I think a lot of it honestly starts with community. You know, that, that tribal aspect will will give you that that um, connection to to people who can kind of have your back, but also inspire you uh, and, and share ideas. And maybe I'm, you know, more collaborative by nature, just, you know, work with Pete's a good example of that. But I really do believe that that's really important, even when you're doing, you know, kind of these sorts of creative, creative things. Yeah, great. Awesome. Um, so on that note, uh, we'll wrap things up here. Again, our thanks to August Cole, a uh, non-resident fellow, for taking some time for all of your questions and talk about the realm of uh, looking at fiction as a tool for exploring future warfare. So again, thanks for coming on. Appreciate your time. And uh, for everyone out there, appreciate you joining us for this week for the Brewcast. Join us next week where we'll be hosting Team Krulak non-resident fellow Paul F. Deal to discuss the changing roles of peacekeepers and peacekeeping. We'll see you all then. Thank you. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.